cold January evening when I landed in Zurich. The flight from Bilbao was empty. It was kind of spooky as we descended into the dark gray and they turned off the cabin lights in this small plane. The good news was I got off the plane quickly because I had a train I might be able to catch. So I walked across the mechanical floors in Zurich Airport, crossed the street into the train station, and I went down those escalators that most of us know to platforms three and four as the train to Lucerne was just leaving. So I had to wait a few minutes, and I went into Zurich main station. And I waited, and it was cold, and I just wanted to be home. So I finally caught the train to Lucerne, connected out to my neighborhood, got off at Emmenbrücke Gersag, walked up to Sonnenplatz, and I stepped into the crosswalk. The next 10 seconds were surreal. It was as though, in my memory, somebody cut 10 seconds of video, and it just went to a darker gray. But two sounds remain. One was that primal animal scream of being ripped apart at midnight in the, wo in the woods by a larger wild animal. And the other sound that I remember was, bam! Ugh! I had been taken out below the knees, and I flipped on top of the hood of the car, and I did a backflip onto my back in the cold, red, wet rain. The next thing I remember is I was spitting out raindrops as the, the rain was coming down on me and the cold pavement. Well, the ambulance arrived very quickly. I can't believe how quickly the ambulance arrived. The next thing, I was on a stretcher into this bright, dry environment and warm. And the medic checked me from head to toe, the back, and she said, she stripped off my clothes, she dried me, and she put me in warm blankets. And then, zap. <laughs> that warm, tingling feeling. Pain? What pain? <laughs> Confusion? One thing was really clear to me is I'm glad I didn't discover morphine at 17 years old. <laughs> I finally stabilized myself, and she said, Mr. Vincent, your shoulder is really bad, but you're going to be okay. And at that moment, I thought about my mother, who had passed away two months earlier. And every time I think about this, I tear up. Not because I had lost my mother, but mothers would be broken if they would have to live through this, and if I would have died. And I thought, I almost joined you, Mom. It was a little too soon, and it was a little too sudden, because fellow souls of the universe, fellow living souls, I want to die a slow death. What better way to unfollow than to die, right? And what worse way <laughs> to be unfollowed than to lose someone? Now, I'm sorry if some of you have watched the loved one die a painful, slow death. So there's one caveat here. I'm a coward myself. I don't want to die a painful death. I just want to die a slow one. And I want to have those deep talks. I want to know what my purpose is. And I want to give my gifts. Four and a half hour surgery the next day. They pieced my shoulder back together, my broken ribs. My arm was really in bad shape. I was black and blue all down my left side, down to here. I was green and yellow down to my knuckles. But I could still type. I could still talk, I could still listen, I could still see, I could still feel, and I could still think. Five days later, I got home, and it was like a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual holiday from the rat race. 
I travel a lot, and I turn that right down. I go out a lot, turn that right down. I cook a lot, turn that right up. Listen to a lot of music. The Beatles and I were doing all right. And I believe that our most creative moments come in the silence. We may be stimulated by, by great conversations or, or lots of information, and it's when we're silent that we're at our most creative and our most wise. My mom's death and my near death, these next three months, I call my winter of wisdom, 2018. And for me, it's, as a university professor of writing told me, the real wisdom, it's timeless and it's universal of the human condition. Look for it in those weird inner places. This is where you will find your unique voice. Now, my winter of wisdom actually took its name from seven years earlier. I had had my summer of sin. I had separated, and I was ready to have fun. Now, <laughs> part of that fun was going out with the boys. And I have three friends, four of us, Anglos, living in Switzerland. The Yank, the Brit, the Kiwi, and the Aussie. And we got together about once every two months at one, at one of our home, and we had dinner. And it got really deep. Ladies, men can do this, by the way. Men, <laughs> we, we really can, especially lots of wine. And I'm the, I'm the oldest one of them. I'm the only self-employed. Uh, I had, with these guys, I had a safe space to be weird and embrace my inner weirdo. And one night, we're going deep, it's around midnight, we're on our fifth bottle of wine, and I said, guys, my age times two equals probably dead. And my Aussie friend went, Jacko, that's dark, mate. And I said, this is not dark, this is light. I've got stuff to do. I've got one trip to the buffet. There's things I'm not going to do, and there's things I've got to get done. Seven years later, I wrote this poem called The Dark Spark. And I'm not going to read the whole poem to you, but don't have time to that. But two verses. It's simple math. My life's half lived like one and one is two. You see dark where I see light. So much for me to do. The spark is my motivation. So before my next accident, and before my last breath, I've got stuff to do. What will my legacy be? I have, as I see it, two gifts to give to the world. Love and value. And those who know me well know that it's the same thing. How will I make the world a better place? How will I touch the hearts of others? How will I be remembered? I don't know about you, but this is important to me. Well, last month, I woke up to some bad news. I'm dying. Could be six months, could be a year, could be six years, could be 10. I'm kind of hoping for like 30 or 35 more good ones, to be honest with you. Okay. Every morning now, I wake up and tell myself the bad news. I'm dying. And this motivates me. There's only so much time left. This is my spark. Fellow living souls, I got bad news for you. You're dying too. <laughs> what will your legacy be? Smart, life of the party, good at making money, created, produced, shared. What are you waiting for? What if I told you that your story today is your legacy? You are living your legacy now. 
Your legacy is your gift. What is it? You only get one trip to the buffet, and you can't put everything on there. For me, the ultimate unfollow is to embrace your inner weirdo. This is what's so lovable about us. This is what's so valuable. Don't suppress it. Listen to it. Find it. Share it. Your most valuable gift is inside of you, and it's probably weird. It's definitely unique. Not everyone will see its value, but those who do will treasure it, create it, produce it, share it. I don't know where our spirits go after we die. Does anybody really? But I do know one thing. I am not an absolutist, but I do know this. Our spirits lie in the hearts of others. Your gift will be in people's hearts. What will it be? Create it. Produce it. Share it. This winter, 2019, I'm in my hometown one year after my accident, and I drove my brother to Albany Airport, upstate New York, and we got out at the curb, got his bag out of the back, man hug, not too much ceremony, we both travel a lot, and off he went. I had felt my phone ring while driving, so I took the opportunity as I got back in the car to call back a friend of mine in Barcelona. And he said, hey, said, oh, this didn't sound good. I'm sorry to break it to you, mate, but Thomas was killed two days ago in the German Autobahn, a single car accident. He's gone, man. Gone. Thomas and I partied all over Europe. Name your city. We partied a lot. We partied hard. We gave each other a lot. Seven or eight very cool cities. Thomas and I going hard, going deep. His wife, his young daughter. We got photo, I've got photos right here as well. He's gone. We had this bromance. Fortunately, the funeral was two months later. Uh, two weeks later. Um, and I came back. I, could, I, was, I got back from the States. And I took the train up to Cologne. And the next morning I woke up. It was a beautiful, crisp, sunny February morning. I walked through his old neighborhood, his neighborhood of Severinstrasse. I got to the church 45 minutes early. And it was so beautifully set. There were probably a dozen people there. The later 200 came. And I walked in and I lost it. And I took my 90 seconds. And as I went back to the back of the church... I was introduced to his daughter, who reminds me so much of my daughter from his first marriage, older, she's my daughter's age, and she was so poised, so generous. She came up to me and she said, you loved him, didn't you? I could see that. And I said, he loved me. And after the service, before going to the cemetery, I walked out to the front of the church, and there she was. And I walked up to her, and I said, you know, your father was the coolest man in the world. Do you know why? She said, why? I said, because he made me feel like the coolest man in the world. And do you know what she said? He made everybody feel that way. That was his gift. Every day, I wake up now, and I know I'm dying, slowly. This is not dark. It's light. If you understand, if you believe that your purpose and your mission is to find your gift, to give your gift, to die a slow death,